part 53. This movement utilizes the movements in part 42 and 43 to restrain, remove the knife and or control the attacker. Please refer to those parts for a breakdown of what's going on. Like most of the videos in this series, the movements are numbered and organized so that you can get a full idea of how things work, which then come in very useful in understanding later videos. It's relatively the same as parts 42 and 43, but with one big exception. There's a knife coming at me from above at speed. This changes everything when put into perspective. Unlike in parts 42 and 43, where the victim will suffer trauma to the head or upper body that they can in many cases recover from, here there is no room for error. An error means the end. The attacker will cause severe, if not fatal, lacerations to the head, neck and vital areas of the body. The way this is done, firstly, is to have the competence and precision to catch the hand with the knife and secondly, be able to have the steadiness and body structure to hold and control the attacker. This sounds simple until you take into account the force, the speed, and the intentions of the attacker. An attacker with such deadly intent will not just give up. Pain and a total physical lock through restraining must be perfectly executed to survive. More can be done, which I will explain. I block while keeping his arm raised at the required angle with my left arm. I put my right arm under his and catch his forearm to hold. When I pull his arm back, the knife will be released. This is because his tendons will be overstretched and it's next to impossible to hold something in a grip. The hand has to open up. Let's see that again in more detail. You can see from the angle the attacker uses to move towards me that he is stable. This is so force can be used efficiently and as hard as they can. This is the way someone could attack. It takes a certain amount of force to stab into something. We should understand that at this point, a large amount of force will be used to attack. In a technique like this, guiding should not be used. Instead, here you see me block with the side of my wrist to the inside of his wrist. You can see how close the knife is to my arm. The slightest mistake would cut me. Accuracy will determine whether the victim gets cut or worse. The block on the wrist caused an abrupt stop to his arm and kept it in place while the rest of his body fell in place. I quickly weave my right arm under his and catch his forearm and it is now I release my left arm from his. My right arm is in contact holding his wrist in place until I do. Leverage to the attacker's arm is done by pivoting my arm. This will release the knife or weapon from their hand. When tendons become overstretched, they open up and release tension instinctively. This is to prevent the tendon snapping and tearing. From this view, you can see how I've held his arm. His elbow is in front of my chest and I have locked his arm in place by pressing my thumb on my index finger. In exceptionally rare cases, the attacker can be released to a police officer. There are a few issues with this wild idea. Will there be police near you when an attacker does this? Will the attacker calm down, make friends with you and go on their way if you let them go? The answer to both questions is no. The correct way to secure your safety is by pivoting the arm swiftly when necessary. You can learn more about what I mean 
in part 42. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button, consider subscribing, leave a comment, and if you know someone that can find this useful, please share it with them. Until next time, holding on to the present stops us planning our future. Holding on to the past stops us enjoying today.